glorious God, thank you for providing us this day, providing us this group of people to gather together and worship you. Lord, we ask that you open our minds, our hearts, and our spirits to receive your word. Allow your word to move deeply with inside of us. Let it mean something to us and let us take it into the world and be a beacon of light for others to come know you. In your heavenly name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Our sermon scripture for today is taken out of Isaiah chapter 40, verses 3 through 24. And this is what it says. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, and the rugged places a plain. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all people will see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, cry out, and I say, what shall I cry? All people are like grass, and all their faithfulness is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, because the breath of the Lord blows on them. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God endures forever. You who bring good news to Zion, go up on a high mountain. You who bring good news to Jerusalem, lift up your voice with a shout, lift it up, do not be afraid. Say to the towns of Judah, here is your God. See the sovereign Lord comes with power and he rules with a mighty arm. See his reward is with him and his recompense accompanies him. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and he carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, or with the breadth of his hand marked off the heavens? Who has held the dust of the earth in a basket, or weighed the mountains on the scales, and the hills in a balance? Who can fathom the spirit of the Lord, or instruct the Lord as he is, as his counselor? Whom did the Lord consult to enlighten him? And who taught him the right way? Who was it that taught him knowledge or showed him the path of understanding? Surely the nations are like a drop in a bucket. They are regarded as dust on the scales. He weighs the islands as though they were fine dust. Lebanon is not sufficient for altar fires, nor its animals enough for burnt offerings. Before him, all the nations are as nothing. They are regarded by him as worthless and less than nothing. With whom then will you compare God? To what image will you liken him? As for an idol, a metal worker cast it, and a goldsmith overlays it with gold and fashions silver chains for it. A person too poor to present such an offering selects wood that will not rot. They looked, <coughs> they looked for a skilled worker to set up an idol that will not topple. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood since the earth was founded? He sits enthroned above the circle of the earth, and its people are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a canopy and spreads them out like a tent to live in. He brings princes to naught and reduces the rulers of this world to nothing. No sooner are they planted, no sooner are they sown, no sooner do they take root in the ground than he blows on them and they wither and a whirlwind sweeps them away like chaff. May God have blessing on his holy word. As we all know, Hurricane Helene was very devastating for many unexpecting 
mountain towns in North Carolina and Tennessee. They experienced severe flooding, power outages, mudslides, whole entire towns being leveled, and many, many other unexplainable tragedies. Their lives, in a split sh second, was shaken to the very foundation. To see this disaster on the news or other forms of social media is almost hypnotizing in the magnitude of their tragedy. And this got me to thinking about our own lives. How when our lives begin to shake, when the very foundations of our lives seem unsure. See, we can all be thrown into a sense of confusion just like these hurricane victims were. And even when our life that we're living seems unsafe, we can always find security in God. See, times like this reminds us that the church and the members in the church, we all need a realistic view of God. When tragedies enter our lives, our view of God sometimes proves too small because we're too overwhelmed. And at such time, God can seem far off. <clears throat> God is not some majestic king sitting on a throne. And sometimes that is our image of God. He's in a distant third heaven. For whatever reason we think this, I have recently become aware that there are many of us who grew up without having a clear idea of God's very nature. We have a limited view of God, and this can be discouraging when we're struck by overwhelming problems of life or disasters. And I read across this story this past week that gives this very image of having an attitude like this. It went... There was a man in a hot air balloon who realized he was lost. So he reduced his altitude and he spotted a woman walking below. He shouted out to her, excuse me, can you help me? I promised a friend I would meet them an hour ago, but I'm lost. The woman replied, you're in a hot air balloon about 30 feet above the ground. You're between 40 and 41 degrees north latitude and between 59 and 60 degrees west longitude. The man responded, you must be an engineer. I am, replied the woman. How did you know? Well, answered the balloonist, everything you told me is technically correct, but I still don't know where I am. The fact is, you haven't been much help at all. If anything, You've only delayed my trip. The woman below responded, You must be in management. <laughs> I am, replied the balloonist. But how did you know? Well, said the woman, You don't know where you are. You don't know where you're going. You have risen to where you are due to a large quantity of hot air. You made a promise which you have no idea how to keep and you expect people beneath you to solve your problems. The fact is, sir, you are in exactly the same position you were in before we met, but somehow it's now my fault. See, when we are lost and we are distressed, it's tempting as humans to blame someone else, especially God. Here again, I believe that's because we lack a clear perception of who God is 
and what God does. And today, I would like for us to <coughs> get a glimpse into the nature of our incomparably great God. And obviously, it can only be a glimpse because that's really all we are capable of doing. Our finite minds can never fully comprehend our infinite Lord and his mind. The book of Isaiah tells us that God describes himself to the Israelites. He was speaking to a society in turmoil and about to collapse. See, they had a fickle, fickle king, Hezekiah, who couldn't really make up his mind whether to be loyal to God or not. And consequently, this made the people unsure as well. And their relationship with God was shaken. It was then that God thundered to the people who he really is. Listen again what verses 9 through 12 say. <coughs> it says, You who bring good news to Zion, go up on a high mountain. You who bring good news to Jerusalem, lift up your voice with a shout. <coughs> lift it up, do not be afraid. Say to the towns of Judah, here is your God. See the sovereign Lord comes with power, and he rules with a mighty arm. See, his reward is with him. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arm and carries them close to his heart. <coughs> he gently leads those that have young. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand? Or with the breadth of his hand marked off the heavens? Who has held the dust of the earth in a basket? Or weighed the mountains on the scales and hills in a balance. You see, the largest seas in the world are nothing but a handful of water in God's hand. And yet, as humans, the seas and the oceans seem vast. But God made all of those seas. And he says they are nothing but water in the palm of his hand. Just like the distance between the planets and the stars, they are so far out of our perceptions. Think about it. How far, truly, are galaxies away from other galaxies? If me or you were traveling at the speed of light, we would never reach them in our lifetimes. But the Bible tells us that God measures the diameter of the universe with the span of his fingers. And God knows how many grains of sand are on each beach. He is an amazing God. Verses 13 through 14 ask, Who can fathom the spirit of the Lord or instruct the Lord as his counselor? Whom did the Lord consult to enlighten him the right way? Who was it that taught him knowledge or showed him the path of understanding? <coughs> These verses tell us about God. How he's all-knowing. Where did he get this knowledge? You know, as humans, we are often impressed by people that have master's degrees, PhDs. We're marveled at people that have high IQs. But God's IQ is infinite. Where we need to be lifting God up, we're trying to make God fit into our prefabricated boxes. When all we really have to do is ask God to tell us about himself. Our society has came so close to making science into a god and scientists into God's prophets. And there's many out there that would say that we've already done that. 
<coughs> yet to, the, to God, their knowledge is absolutely nothing. And any PhD holder who fears the Lord, they will tell you the same thing. Because for all that has been learned about quantum mechanics or the mysteries of the human mind, there's still not a cure for the common cold. And we still declare lunatics to be sane and sane people to be lunatics. Verse 15 declares this. Surely the nations are like a drop in the bucket. They are regarded as dust on the scales. He weighs the islands as they were fine dust. Our God governors the universe. And yet he is still intimately involved in each of our lives. <coughs> we need, as a collective, to be very careful <coughs> not to think too highly of nations or those who govern them. <coughs> See, today people are too quick to elevate their leaders and governments to the level of God. But the scriptures tell us that they are like dust particles on a scale. See, some relate God to the laws of science. But God is not a scientist who obeys specific scientific laws. He is the author and the finishers of all laws and more. <coughs> and we can find this out in Isaiah 38, verses 4 through 8, in which Isaiah conveys God's message to King Hezekiah. He says, Then the word of the Lord came to Isaiah. Go and tell Hezekiah, this is what the Lord, the God of your father David, says. I have heard your prayer and seen your tears. I will add 15 years to your life, and I will defend the city. This is the Lord's sign to you that the Lord will do what he has promised. I will make the shadow cast by the sun go back the 10 steps that it has gone down on the stairway of Ahaz. So the sunlight went back the 10 steps it had gone down. In case of any of you do not know what it means to make the shadow cast by the sun go back ten steps. It's the same as adding 40 minutes to the length of the day. <coughs> In other words, God not only created this universe, but he's still actively in control of the universe and everything in it. He controls the movement of the planets and time itself. And as it says in Luke 1, verse 37, I'm going to use the King James Version. It says, For with God, nothing shall be impossible. I think this is where a lot of Christians get stumped because we'll say this to people. We know this but it's often abstract when it comes to us in our personal lives. We have a problem knowing that God will do anything for us. We'll tell people that God can do anything, but how genuinely do we believe it when we are in front and faced with a disaster in our lives? The God of the Bible was a living God. A very personal one at that. See, the Philistines, they often worshipped gods that were made of stone or wood. The Israelites had forsaken God. But David knew that God was the God of all creation, and he was a living God. Listen to what David said in 1 Samuel 
chapter 17, verse 36. He said, your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them <coughs> because he has defied the armies of the living God. The idea that God was real and alive had not entered into the minds of the Philistines. And for that matter, most of the Israelites as well. They were worshiping gods made of stone and wood. Gods devised by their own imaginations. And that's why in Isaiah 40, verses 18 through 20, the questions are asked. With whom then will you compare God? To what image will you liken him? As for an idol, a metal worker cast it, and a goldsmith overlays it with gold and fashions silver chains for it. A person too poor <coughs> to present such an offering selects wood that will not rot. They look for a skilled worker to set up an idol that will not topple. Now, most of us will say, well, we don't see this in Christianity today. But how funny would it not be to walk out your door and see your neighbor praying to his, uh, at, at his apple tree, any tree, or watch him peel a fruit and offer it to a rock? <coughs> But that's exactly what Isaiah was saying here about this ancient idolatry. It was just as crazy. Today, however, we do see idolatry in different areas. Anytime you or I make a person, a goal, an institution, or anything else, equal to or higher than the living God in our lives. They get the loyalty, they get the priority over God. Then we are committing idolatry. That's exactly what idolatry is. Giving to anyone or anything the loyalty and devotion that God deserves. That even includes <coughs> the things that we feel deserves our time and resources more than our worship of God. We are all born worshipers. Every individual on this planet are born worshipers. Even so-called atheists. They may claim they do not worship in gods. But in God's eyes, they worship themselves or whatever else gives them pleasure. So if you think about it, Isaiah really does have humor in verse 20. Because he is basically saying, yes, some of you are poor, and you say that you don't have gold to cover your idols with. Well, if that's the case, be very careful of the wood you choose because it might be eaten by termites and rot. Then he says, oh, by the way, make sure you nail down that idol, or it might just fall off its pedestal and break. <coughs> this still goes on today as well. Think about how people treat their idols in Hollywood, how they put them on a pedestal. They follow and even envy their lives. They follow every success. They, they pay them a lot of money to be entertained by them. And then, morbidly, they spend even more money to read about their failures and human weaknesses. And that's what Isaiah was saying. Our God cannot be compared with a physical object or human icon. He's very much alive, <coughs> and he is without weakness or failure. All that he declares is accomplished, 
anything or anyone that we put ahead of him is bowing down to deaf and dumb idols of ancient times. Now we tend to put material things ahead of God. Every time we make our jobs, our leisures, our worries, our fears, our friends, more important than worshiping our God. We show that our view and estimation of God is lacking. That is why Isaiah said this. He said, do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood since the earth was founded? He sits enthroned above the circle of the earth. And its people are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a canopy and spreads them out like a tent to live in. He brings princes to naught and reduces the rulers of this world to nothing. No sooner are they planted, no sooner are they sown, no sooner do they take root in the ground, then he blows on them, and they wither, and a whirlwind sweeps them away like chafe. Our God is not only incomparably great compared to the idols of ancient, but he's incomparably great in his relationship with us and the rulers of this world. Because even the greatest leaders of this world cannot escape what is common to man, and that is death. <coughs> so to, to summarize, number one, our God is all-powerful. He's all-knowing, and he's everywhere. His arm rules for him. God's arm. That is, his son, Jesus Christ, shows us God's power. With Jesus Christ, nothing is ever impossible, be it mountains to move, problems to solve, or bodies to heal. Second, God is very personal. He is a living being. <coughs> his reward is with him. It shows us that he is a very personal God. A God who has great desires in his relationship with every single human being. He came down into the pit with you and I in order to lift us out. He relates to us, to every pain or sorrow we have, as well as every joy and triumph. And he listens to us, even when we don't make sense. He's there to lend an ear. Third, God is the perfect loving shepherd. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He shows us that he is a powerful yet tender shepherd. He will not abandon us and wherever he leads he will always make sure we have perfect peace Psalm 34 18 and 19 reminds us of this it says the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and save those who are crushed in spirit the righteous person may have many troubles but the Lord delivers him from them all and Jesus himself reminded us in John chapter 6, verses 48 through 51. He said, I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. 
This bread is my flesh, which I give for the life of this world. We all know that to be true. So let us all together gather around his table and worship our Lord and Savior as well as our awesome God. Let us partake in the Lord's Supper at this time. Will the elders come forward? Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for being such a great and wonderful God. Lord, we thank you for providing us with a Savior so that we are not condemned to death. Lord, we lift you up in praises and we shout your name. Be with us as we partake in your supper and help us to Remember how glorious you really are. In your name we pray. Amen.
Hey, we're, I've changed my mind. I'm a woman. I have that right. <laughs> 426, blessed be the tie that binds. 426. We'll sing the first verse. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we open our hearts and our minds to receive the truth of who you really are. Lord, you are not just an image that makes us feel comfortable. Lord, our world is just mere shadows and mirrors. Our society is dead. Lord, we ask you to be with uh, the people in Florida as they face another hurricane. Lord, just know that as your servants, we have an unquenchable hunger for your light, for your relationship, and for your word. Lord, help us to be a beacon of light for those that are going through hardships now and in the future. In your son's Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Oh, 